Good morning. Good morning. My name is Inez Barron, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Today, we are seeking an update on Local Law 161 of 2016, which was enacted from legislation I introduced last session to establish a task force to review proposals for restoring free tuition at the City University of New York. For 129 years, residents attended public higher education institution at no cost for tuition. Beginning in 1847, New York City established the Free Academy with admission based on merit and offering liberal arts, career training, fostering intellectual freedom, and rigorous academic standards. Even during the challenging times of the Great Depression, there was no tuition. And two new colleges were constructed during that time. The system grew to six senior colleges and three community colleges that were then consolidated as CUNY in 1961. The CUNY, the CUNY student body remained predominantly white for middle class families. In 1970, pressure from the civil rights movement and mass protests by black and Latino students forced an era of, quote, open admissions. In the next five years following that time, black enrollment grew by 55%, and blacks and Latinos represented 42% of CUNY's 1979 graduating class. But unfortunately, city and state did not commit sufficient funding to support the expanding operating cost. In 1976, Facing financial constraints, the city agreed to let the state take over the operating costs for senior colleges. Several board members resigned in protest to the proposed imposition of tuition. Under Chair Herman Badillo, CUNY eliminated remedial classes at all senior colleges, which forced many students to attend community colleges. You may note, however, that there are several elite colleges that still offer remedial classes. An earlier report of the Committee for, Pire, for Public Higher Education, Inc., based on the cost of tuition, a study of the City University of New York, uh, published about 18, 1984, included a recommendation that the City of New York should support the tuition-free policy at City University as an essential service for its, relative, its residents. In 1975, tuition and fees accounted for 17% of the CUNY funding. The city put in 47% and the state contributed 40, but that has drastically changed. I am personally a beneficiary of this historic commitment having graduated from Hunter College in the 1960s, January 1967. And I've made clear that we should all be working to restore CUNY to its former glory as the free University of New York City. Indeed, we have had multiple hear related hearings exploring such topics as CUNY graduation rates, student debt, and food insecurity. Most recently at our March budget hearing, we heard from a young CUNY student named Levi who had not eaten in two days so that he could ration his expenses to afford a Metro card to get to and from his classes. His experience is all too common and yet we sit by idly instead of pursuing solutions that can help the city and state restore free tuition at CUNY and help students like Levi. As I have already acknowledged previously, the path to restoring a free tuition policy isn't easy. CUNY is a large institution with a multi-layered bureaucracy reliant on local, state, and federal funding accountable to a central administration, a board of trustees, and the New York State Board of Regents. There are obviously a lot of political interests and financial interests at play. And there are legitimate policy debates that surround this issue. That's why the task force created by Local Law 161 of 2016 was constituted so that it could examine the obstacles and produce a report with recommendations on how, we could, on how they could be addressed. 
It was my hope that once we had the report, we could discuss and take concrete steps towards advancing a tuition-free CUNY. The report was due October 15th and was completed December uh, 23rd, 2017. I do want to acknowledge the members of the task force and to thank them for their time, their commitment, their input, their expertise. Co-chairs Stephen Breyer and Hercules Reed and the members Charles Bendit, Deborah Bile, Barbara Bowen, Jose Calderon, Una Clark, William Goodlow, Ty Johnson, Tirza Nasser, Lisette Nieves, and Ria Wong. And these were members appointed by the mayor and the then speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, and the public advocate. I would like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Councilmember Holden, who is here, and I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Joy Simmons, my Legislative Director, and CUNY Liaison, Indigo Washington, the committee's finance analyst, Jessica Ackerman, and wish her well, she's going to be leaving, our policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, and our committee counsel, Paul Senegal. And at this time, we're gonna call the first panel and uh, I'm sure that as we get to hear from them, they too will share their frustration that a report that was completed in December is only just now being released. And part of that delay was because I was asked by the administration to hold off on having a public, uh, public hearing on the issue because the mayor wanted to be involved. Here it is six months later and the mayor has not been involved, has not had input, has not had his deputy mayor give us the figures that we ask for that would be financially tied to the recommendations in this report. It's very disheartening, very um, frustrating, and an unnecessary delay. But we're going straight ahead, we're going to go forward, and we're going to make sure that this report gets a hearing and that this report has impact on CUNY's future. So at this time, I'm going to call the two panelists. And we're gonna start with the co-chairs of the task force report, and that is Stephen Breyer from CUNY and Hercules Reed, City Council Task Force. If you would come forward, the council will administer the oath. Good morning. Do you affirm to tell the truth? Oh, would you raise your right hand, please? Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. I do. Please state your names for the record. Hercules Emil Reed. Stephen Breyer. Yes. I know, huh? Stephen Breyer. Okay, you can begin with your testimony. You want me to go first? Yeah. I want to thank Councilmember Barron for her tireless work in support of CUNY and this task force and for convening this hearing. The City University of New York has been recognized since its inception more than 170 years ago as an especially successful and efficient engine of upward mobility for the city's poor and working class citizens, um, what one of its founding leaders termed the children of the whole people. This was especially true of recent immigrants and or racial and ethnic minority groups starting in the late 19th century. This early public commitment to municipal higher education included the provision via city tax dollars of free tuition for CUNY's full-time students. That commit commitment was significantly broadened and democratized further in 1969 when CUNY students, supported by faculty and community members, forced the system through massed actions to open its doors widely to let in all of the city's high school graduates. A proud moment in the, in the history of the city and of the city university. For the next seven years, CUNY was arguably the most important and admired public education system in the world. But like most public institutions, CUNY suffered egregiously from the austerity policies imposed on it after the city's 1976-77 fiscal crisis, 
One of the first things to be abolished, as the council member noted, was free tuition, followed by ever-tightening admission standards for entry into CUNY's senior colleges. CUNY has struggled over the next four decades after 1977 with ever-decreasing city and especially state support, which has been filled in by increased revenue from student tuition. That cutback in funding intensified the imposition of neoliberal policies by the city and state, effectively privatizing many public functions, resulting in the undermining of public institutions like CUNY. But the rising crescendo of public concern and anger over increasing income inequality, not only in the city but across the nation, following the 2008 economic downturn, has put the issue of CUNY's long-term sustainability and public support back on the agenda. That concern, thanks to the strong leadership of Council Member Inez Barron as chair of this committee, pushed the New York City Council, as you've heard last year, to pass the law authorizing the task force to consider CUNY's future and explore what CUNY, now the th nation's third largest public university system, will need moving forward to assure the academic success of its 275,000 undergraduates. And in a word, the task force report suggests that there are three ways in which um, CUNY needs to be supported to be able to realize that mission. One, of course, is to make um, admission to CUNY affordable and widely available. For the free tuition is, is one key sort of leg of this three-legged stool. The second is a very serious recommitment to hiring more full-time faculty, people like myself. I'm a faculty member at the CUNY Graduate Center. We have lost 3,000 full-time faculty members alone since 1977. We need to get more full-time faculty, and at the same time, we need to pay our adjuncts much more than we're paying now. They're living on starvation wages. That's the second leg of the stool. And the third to guarantee access and, and a good education is that we need to fix CUNY's infrastructure. We need to make an effort to, to the, 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 the working and, and learning and teaching conditions at our institutions are, I would settle for satisfactory. I, I would love them to be world class, but I would settle for them to be satisfactory. As co-chair of the task force, I am proud of the work that my colleagues and I were able to do in a short span of three months at the end of last year. We completed our work and submitted this white paper two days before Christmas, as you've heard, to Mayor de Blasio's staff. This draft report has been sitting on the, in the mayor's office now for the past five months without action. I call on the mayor and his staff to make this report and the recommendations that it offers public and to launch a public process for considering how the city and state can and should find the necessary funds to assure CUNY's vital role in the life of the city and state in the coming years. Thank you. Greetings to the Higher Education, Com Higher Education Committee and to members of City Council. I would like to say um, thank you to uh, my council member from my district, Alika Samuel, for being in the room today. Um, my name is Hercules Reed, and I am the co-chair of New York City Council's CUNY Task Force. It is a privilege to be appointed by the Speaker of the City Council to serve as a student voice, both past and present, in providing progress for our future. This opportunity has been a platform to take what I have learned and advocated for as a former two-term student government president of New York City College of Technology and vice chair for legislative affairs for the University Student Senate and assist in putting, in putting it into legislation. I would like to make a special mention to the sponsors of this bill to remind them of the commitment that they made. This task force was sponsored by council member Council members Inez Barron, sorry, um, Inez Barron, Margaret Chen, Inez Dickens, Daniel Drum, Deborah Rose, Andrew Cohn, Jamani Williams, Robert Cornegy, Ben Kalos, Idanis Rodriguez, Helen Rosenthal, Donovan Richards, Annabelle Palma, Brad Lander, Stephen Levin, Paul Vallone, Rory, Rory Lanceman. Vincent Gentile, and the public advocate, Ms. Letitia, Letitia James. I would like to express extreme gratitude towards the chair of the Higher Education Committee, Council Member Inez Barron, who has played a significant role in the creation of this task force and has remained invested 
being an authentic voice for the people, especially for our beloved CUNY. This task force assembled a team of 12 people from various walks of life, allowing for multiple perspectives to express their thoughts and concerns about CUNY, thus creating the white paper that we can share. The task force worked diligently and produced a recommendation report that researched historical and current data on CUNY and reviewed best practices. The white paper offers recommendations in three specific areas. What the real cost of attendance is for CUNY students and how addressing these costs would improve access and graduation rates. Two, how to ensure that CUNY faculty are adequately supported academically and financially so they are entirely able to help their students achieve academic success. And three, what needs to be done to ensure that the physical environment of CUNY's 24 campuses is conducive to the teaching and learning that are necessary to make possible student success. It has not been an easy road to get to this point and I would like to apologize to the public on record for the delay in the release of the white paper. According to Local Law 161, as was mentioned, the report was, final, was to be finalized in October 2017. The task force requested an extension to produce a more thorough report by December 2017. The white paper, was, the white paper draft was completed and, the, and a public announcement was in order. It was requested that the release be canceled to allow time for the mayor's office to read and provide feedback. As of yesterday evening, we finally received input from the Deputy Mayor's Office. I am calling on all the sponsors of this legislation, the CUNY community and elected officials to band together on this report and make sure it sees the light of day. Very often great work like this falls on deaf ears and no change comes of it. We cannot do this alone and if you believe in the power of higher education, it is time now more than ever to take advantage of the weight of this document and command the change and investment we need to make CUNY more accessible, affordable, which will impact graduation rates. There's a song by an artist named Big Sean, One Man Can Change the World. This song inspired me to, because it represents not being able to rely on people who give their word to make a difference. I realized a long time ago I was on this planet to serve a bigger purpose than myself. I will continue to fight for the 500,000 plus students, present and to come, who deserve a chance, just like I received in life. It takes more than one person to change the world, but every day, like my ancestors, I will at least let it begin with me. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for their presentation, and I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by two more council members, council member Alika Anthony Samuel, who we identified as your Council Member and Council Member Lori Cumbo, we're glad that you're here. Um, I just want to highlight what the recommendations are that were that are included. I think it's important that they be uh, read into the record. So I think I've summarized them. There are 21 recommendations. Number one, eliminate all tuition charges. Two, establish an emergency fund of no less than $5 million to respond to immediate student needs with financial problems. Three, that the DOE and CUNY each hire and train sufficient full-time guidance counselors. Four, that we expand ASAP. Five, implement a CUNY Institute for Adult Learners uh, for non-traditional students, students with disabilities, veterans, and expand the Black Male Initiative. Six, expand CUNY Child Care Centers. Seven, underwrite $500 million Martin Luther King Scholarship for low-income CUNY and SUNY students, and that's uh, in a bill that was introduced by my husband, Assemblymember Charles Barron in Albany. Eight, expand CUNY Single Stop. Nine, free or reduced Metro cards for CUNY students. 10, uh, expand the FAFSA registration by undergrads to eventually encompass all of CUNY. 11, make the new changes in the math remediation program sustainable. 12, a belief that connected CUNY is a necessary step in order to assist CUNY. 
13, an ongoing review of pathways process and CUNY's campus articulation agreement. 14, increase salaries in the number of full-time CUNY faculty. 15, convert part-time to full-time faculty, as many as possible. 16, develop basic orientation and training programs to establish and improve student mentoring and advisement. 17, make full-time faculty pay, pay scales competitive with other similar public university systems nationally. 18, recommend CUNY management be required to submit an annual report to the Council of Higher, Committee on Higher Education and Borough Presidents about the status of all prior Reso A funding. 19, determine if all building and land are being used adequately for educational purposes. 20, assess the progress re ADA compliance at each campus. And 21, submit an annual report on this disability uh, study. So I wanted to read into the record those 21 recommendations so that those of you who don't have an opportunity to get a copy, which is by the sergeant's desk, you will know what they are. Um, I'm going to, I, you know I've got lots of questions, but I, I've been involved with talking to you and I'm going to defer to my colleagues who might have questions. Councilmember Holden, do you have any questions? As, some, as a student in CUNY and as a faculty member for 40 years, I can attest to the fact that CUNY has been neglected, never funded properly in my 40 years. Actually, it's over 40 years if you, if you consider my uh, um, eight years as a, uh, as a student. Um, and what, what the recommendations are, are certainly right on. I'm just, I have a question though on the, um, on the task force. Um, how does that fit in with the uh, Pell Grants and the um, and TAP if, if there's a free tuition? Do we get federal funding? I, I, I'll respond quickly. I think when we were talking about free tuition, we were not simply assuming that the city would take on the responsibility of okay, so, underwriting the right. tuition bill. It would be a top up. It would, after TAP, you tell mic. whatever, I'm sorry, whatever, um, yeah, whatever was, was short from TAP and Pell funding mm -hmm. would be topped up by this free tuition okay. package. Yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah. that clears it. Um, an, another thing, um, and, and Hercules, you cer certainly know about city tech's problem with the uh, infrastructure. Um, I visited uh, many public schools, actually all of them in my district, and um, I can attest that the public schools have a better infrastructure, at least in my district, than any of the colleges I attended in CUNY. Um, smart boards in every class. We didn't have that in, at, uh, in my department. We had one smart board. Um, the elevators didn't work. The roof leaked. There was mold throughout the building at City Tech. Um, it was, it's amazing that what the faculty were able to do despite the, uh, the college uh, infrastructure. But the biggest hurdle, and, I, and I, I'm glad the task force is addressing this, we had 100, we had 20 full-time faculty members in my department, over 100 adjunct professors or uh, lecturers. Now, that's a problem. That's a problem on a number of levels. Um, as, as you know, at that time at least, uh, I know Barbara Bowen has fought for office hours. We got a one, one office hour, if you, I think if you had six hours um, of uh, adjunct, and that was a, a great, great um, accomplishment. Um, but it's not enough. Um, and with, with um, over, how do you actually manage 100 adjunct faculty in a department? How does the chair actually work and how does anybody get, you know, coordinate any meetings the adjuncts weren't required and shouldn't be required to attend? So we need more full-time faculty. And the adjunct pool that you have, at least in my department, was magnificent. They were working professionals who would have loved to get a full-time position. Yet, the administration, the, the city, the state, we never got enough lines, ever. So this, I, I think you could, you could double the full-time positions and still not address the needs of, of CUNY students who are, uh, you know, again, they, they have the deck stacked against them. Uh, many of them um, 
have not only financial issues, but they don't really know how to maneuver college, college life. And you really need, and I would sit and talk with many of them and counsel them. However, we got to a point where so many fell by the wayside and because you just couldn't, they're just a very large department. And, and um, we, we have an issue at CUNY, not only of a disrespect for the full-time staff and not paying them enough, but the adjunct staff, to me, were abused. And not only in pay, but in just the workload, they had to stay extra hours. You couldn't, if you had a class of 25 students, you couldn't get to everyone in a, in a, in a two and a half hour class. And we would stay, many of the adjuncts would stay two, two or three hours after class for free. They didn't get paid for that. So these recommendations are great. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts uh, of, the, of the task force. Um, and I just hope the mayor's office, and if we can get the governor to weigh in on this, um, certainly um, it, it, the mayor's office, I, I'm sure, will respond. Um, and I, I will speak to the mayor about this because I, I've been on the front lines, and, uh, and CUNY actually, um, I would be, I don't know where I'd be without CUNY. Uh, CUNY actually is my life, was my life, and um, I owe a lot to CUNY, and I'll fight for CUNY. Um, and we need other people uh, in the government to realize that this is a gem, but we, we have to actually address so many needs, and, and the infrastructure, the, the capital projects that are needed, um, of course, billions. They've started to address a little bit, but especially at, at City Tech, but um, still more is needed. But I would, if one recommendation that I, I would think is most needed is the adjuncts, taking care of the adjuncts, making them into full time. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Cumber. Thank you, Chair Barron. Wanted to. Uh, further a point that was just brought up. So you said from 1976, did you say, on that you would lost over 3,000 uh, full-time faculty? Yeah, after, after the fiscal crisis, the cutback was dramatic. It was, went from roughly 10,000 to 7,000, something like that. It was a, and, and what happened in that, in that following 40 years was the increase in the number of adjuncts and part-time faculty teaching at CUNY increased to the point where it's about half the workforce right now, the contact hours is with, with part-time workers. And so those 3,000 faculty that were lost that were full-time was never replaced? Never, or never replaced. There's been small increments by the CUNY administration in the 1990s and after 2000, so we've gotten a f several hundreds of those lines back, and so there, are, there has been some new faculty hiring. But let's remember the, 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 the enrollment is, is at the highest level it's ever been in CUNY's history. It's pushing mm. 275,000 undergraduates. So we, we've, we've let opened the doors at one level to more students, particularly at the community colleges, but we've not sort of co comparably increased the number of full-time faculty. Do you feel that there's a pathway that adjunct professors understand to full-time professorship, do they understand that there's a pathway or is there a pathway? There is not a pathway. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a crapshoot, frankly. I teach at the Graduate Center, I teach doctoral students, and their biggest concern is what's, what's, what are my prospects to get a full-time academic job? Many of them work four, five, and six different ad adjunct positions to cobble together a tiny living. The other thing I would m point out, in addition to um, hiring more full-time faculty, we pay our adjuncts abysmally. The average uh, uh, pay for adjunct faculty is between $3,000 and $3,500 as starting wage. One of the demands that our union, the PSC CUNY, has made is that should be raised to $7,000. I agree. Uh, because it's the only way that people can make a, a, at all a, a living wage and continue to, these are people with PhDs and they're working for essentially $18,000 a year if they teach four or five adjunct classes. And where do you feel that we are in that movement? Because I feel that, I feel that two things need to happen as part of the goals, is that adjuncts do have to be compensated adequately for the work that they're doing. Because I, I think there also needs to be, I uh, taught as an adjunct for a number of years, and um, no one calculates 
the amount of time it takes to right. work with students, as you suggested, um, after class, the amount of uh, support and assistance they need with their thesis, the number of letters of recommendation that you have to write, like all of these different things are not calculated into the time that it takes for an adjunct to effectively teach a course. And I feel that um, office hours and all of these different sorts of things, that was also a challenge for me was that office hours were not, um, we didn't have an office and we didn't have a space where students could right. come and meet with us or to talk with us. So it might you know, turn out to be a meeting in a lounge or a meeting somewhere in the lobby or going out for coffee or all right. these different things, which would ultimately cost you money as well. So it's all of these different dynamics. So we're definitely in full support of seeing that and also wanting to see a pathway that adjuncts understand that there is a process that you can become full-time faculty if you've taught for a number of years, that you've expressed interest in wanting to do that, right. you should be able to do that. And that's one of the recommendations, that the ta as, as Council Member Barron read, that's one of the recommendations, that there be some kind of a structure where you know, dedicated adjuncts who've worked, in some cases, decades at mm -hmm. CUNY have a pathway to full-time st status if and when full-time positions become available. That's the, the, that's the fair thing to do for the people who've made that kind of commitment to our institution. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, just to extend that concept a little about increasing staff, you know, I always express my concern about how disappointed I am at the low numbers of black faculty I at agree. CUNY. Absolutely. It's flatlined, right. it has not gone up, uh, even though there may have been a number of people who were applicants there's not a comparable number of applicants who are give, granted interviews, and there's still the old boy network of the chairs making the decisions about who's coming in. So mm -hmm. that's certainly not for you, but yeah. just to <laughs> get it on the record once again, that we need to address that and topic if, as well. If I may interject as well, um, from the student voice, where you guys as previous adjuncts, adjuncts, professors, um, know how the, the amount of adjuncts affects and the, the, the funding for adjuncts yeah. affects, you know, individuals, you know, coming from a, a student's perspective, um, talking about adjuncts not having office hours and, you know, you have your full-time job and maybe kids and you have your full-time classes and trying to maneuver around, trying to meet with a professor just to answer one question for you or mm. to really get feedback on something so that you can get the, the grade that you want or deserve, um, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, I myself have been in that scenario. I've, I know many of students who truly suffer because adjuncts themselves are suffering, right? Um, because they have to run. They, I'm sure many of them would love to stick around and have these conversations and support these students, but like was mentioned, they're running to their next adjunct position job or they're you know, trying to handle what load of the classroom size that they have. Um, so I definitely want to continue to just highlight the need of, you know, one, funding these professors who can then in turn directly impact students' lives a little bit more because they are a little bit more comfortable in their own shoes. Just before I go to my colleague, uh, Alika Samuel, does, I can't recall if the task force talks about how online classes might be a source of increasing you didn't. Okay. So. We did. We did. We did. Uh, if we did very, maybe a sentence or two. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an instructional technologist, so I have a strong set of ideas and beliefs mm -hmm. about this. Yeah. But I also don't believe, because I'm an instructional technologist and I teach interactive technology and pedagogy at the Graduate Center, I don't believe online courses, completely online, are the answer for our students. Mm -hmm. What we need is blended courses, what we call hybrid courses, because our students need particularly strong attention from faculty members face to face, as well as whatever they can do at a distance. So I think we, we want to do that, but we want to do it carefully and thoughtfully. Okay. Uh, Council Member Samuel. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to um, just put on the record that I am a CUNY graduate. I am a proud CUNY graduate and um, truly believe that the woman that I am today 
um, a graduate of CUNY Law School, as well as a member of the New York City Council, having been born and raised in New York City Housing Authority, having been born and raised in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, I am sitting here today because of CUNY and will do everything I can within my capacity and my position to be supportive of, of everything. And um, I just want to say hey, hey <laughs> to my constituent. Hey. I, I love you, and um, I am just so proud of, of where you are today um, because of CUNY, right? Yeah. And, and your upbringing. Um, but I just had a question about the Board of Trustees. Was there any um, input or um, collaboration or um, um, like meetings or anything at all? Like, just can you describe the relationship if there was any between the task force and um, the board, the CUNY board at all? So as of right now, answer is no. What we had was a representative, um, Una Clark, Trustee Clark, who sat on the task force. So that was um, essentially a direct connection to the task force. Um, and of course, she gave her input and feedback based on her role and also as a fellow CUNY lover. Um, but have we sat down with multiple people on the board of trustees and had these conversations? No. Um, we are looking forward to it. Um, as this is a definite document that we want to make sure that we do get their input and um, their feedback on what can be included and what can be worked on. So, yeah. Okay. Because I was just trying to figure out if maybe um, their level of input or, um, I don't want to say support, but just their involvement, if it would help push things along at all um, with some of the recommendations or even the release. We welcome the opportunity for uh, Trustee Clark to help us make that a, a reality, but it's 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 going to be difficult until the mayor lets the report out publicly, and we can have a chance to really discuss what we proposed in the 21 recommendations and, and try to figure out how to make them a reality or many of them as we can. Um, then it seems to me that's appropriate, an appropriate moment for the CUNY Central Administration and the, okay. and the trustees to be actively involved in that. We, we would have welcomed any feedback at that point. It was a very, it was a very open-ended process. And the final meeting, which we held at the Graduate Center, where I teach, um, with, with, with council member Barron came, Trustee Clark came, se several of the members of the task force were there as well to vote on the final report, the report that you see that we, we submitted back in, mm -hmm. in December. We think that's a, a, a conversation that needs, should have started right away after the new year. And we're sad five months later that it is not. And, and, and definitely um, on the aspect of confidentiality, I think that was probably another level of respect that again, the mayor's office acts that we keep it almost to ourselves until they were able to give specific feedback and the document could go public where we can have these conversations with a wider audience. Um, and we've been sitting you know, on that. Um, I myself have spoken to Trustee Clark and she's been you know, behind the scenes definitely prodding things um, as well as um, the individual's name slips my mind but she also introduced me to another uh, Board of Trustees member. Um, I think his name is uh, Michael, um, he's one of the Mayor, or mayoral, mayoral trustees. Um, I started keeping him in the loop as well, and he would have been here today. But of course, it was graduations in Staten Island. But um, some of them are definitely aware. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just one further question. In terms, uh, following up, the task force. You were the uh, law said that you should have at least three meetings. So did you fulfill that obligations? How often did you meet? How many times did you meet? Did you three meet times. the three we, times? We guarantee met three times um, with quorum, okay. with quorum. And how, how did the members contribute to the document that you produced? In what way were they engaged? So in the, in the first few meetings, it was very general conversations were being had, input, feedback, and then um, essentially meeting minutes was produced. Um, I believe it was in the third meeting when we actually started to get deeper into the project where we also split up into subcommittees where individuals who were interested in say infrastructure or faculty or the student aspect attended particular meetings geared around that. Um, and then after we got all the input and buy-in from all the members of the task force, um, I will definitely say Steve Breyer was a huge engine behind, you know, 
typing it out and putting it into a document, um, as well as at the time, Charissa Townsend um, and me giving feedback to the two great people. <laughs> um, and then after that point, we went and had our final meeting, which you were a part of, and we presented the document that came out of the different levels of the meetings. Um, we asked for feedback from all the members. Um, some gave, some didn't. Um, and then after we had that final meeting was when um, we went back to working on the engine of typing it out, making the adjustments. Um, and then that's when in December we finally had the draft that you see today. Did all of the members uh, have an opportunity to receive a copy of the draft? I personally sent all task force members a copy on at least two occasions. Okay. And I, before it was finalized on December 23rd, I made a point of sending that penultimate draft to all the members of the, the, of the task force to ask for their feedback. And we got, as Hercules suggests, some feedback, others were content with the way it was, and that's the document we produced. We gave it to Charissa Townsend, who was on the mayor's staff, not on the council staff. She was the staff mm -hmm. to the task force, and she produced the final document, which frankly, until we got um, uh, Hercules to sort of put together the, the, the thing you see, I've never actually seen the final document that went to the mayor's office. All I have is my penultimate draft that went to her. Were there any objections to recommendations that are contained in this report? Or would you say the group was in consensus that uh, all of the items in this were items that they could uh, embrace? What I would say is that in my last email where I did send the draft again, I specifically requested that if any feedback was needed to be provided, um, and by silencing your feedback would sound as you're agreeing to what's in the document. Um, I would say only one task force member, um, Lisette Nivez, she was the only one that said, I want to give feedback, but of as of today, which this happened like two, three weeks ago, I have not received any type of feedback. I think that's very important that we get that into the record. That's why I asked those questions. Um, are there any further questions? If not, we want to thank you for your testimony, thank you for your work, thank you for your dedication, thank you for your persistence, and thank you for continuing the fight, because it is a fight. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll next call uh, the CUNY representative and we're gonna have David Crook, who is the University Dean for the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, come and give testimony. Okay, I'm going to ask the council to uh, administer the oath. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your name for the record. David Crook. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Barron. Uh, and uh, members of the Higher Education Committee. Uh, I am David Crook, CUNY's Associate University Provost for Academic Affairs. I've got a promotion. Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning about the report of the uh, Task Force on Affordability, Admissions, and Graduation Rates at the City University of New York. Uh, the Council and, and the Task Force that pr prepared the report deserves our great appreciation uh, for identifying the ingredients that are crucial to uh, student success. Uh, academic support uh, is, is key. Uh, by this, I mean the kind of help that students need to guide and sustain them in their studies uh, to, through to degree completion. Uh, and non-academic support, all the various sorts of, of support other than support for the academic work that they're doing, meaning financial aid, paying for the many costs associated with going to college, 
uh, living expenses such as transportation, emergencies, uh, child care. Our, our undergraduate students are non-traditional students in, in some respects and traditional in, in many other ways. 42% uh, have a household income less than $20,000 a year. 58% uh, receive Pell Grants and about one in eight are, are parents. Uh, certain groups of students, uh, as the report mentions, uh, students who are entering or returning uh, to college, students who have disabilities, veterans, low-income students, students of color, uh, have distinct needs even over and apart the general needs that I just uh, cited in, in, the, in the basic statistics. And, um, and so consistent with the recommendations of the, of the task force, the university uh, has been and must be sensitive to the special needs of, of these uh, populations. Um, finally, uh, no university can serve its students well unless it is able to recruit and retain excellent faculty. Uh, Full-time faculty um, are the lifeblood of our teaching corps, uh, dedicated to CUNY's mission and to the success of our students. Uh, they demonstrate this commitment every day in the classroom, um, uh, in their work to design a rigorous, rigorous curriculum, uh, their meetings with students, uh, and in their careers as scholars. Um, both teaching and learning take place in buildings that need to be maintained, and so proper working conditions and teaching conditions uh, we acknowledge are, are essential. Uh, and, um, but this morning, uh, I will focus my remarks on the uh, prog progress that the university has made uh, in raising the success rates of students, acknowledging the needs uh, that are cited in the report for uh, uh, better support of faculty and for the infrastructure. Um, I will be focusing uh, on the academic uh, part uh, uh, of, of uh, the equation and the recommendations uh, in the report. Today, uh, coincidentally, is a day of great celebration at CUNY, as we've mentioned. Uh, I understand that no fewer than six graduation ceremonies are taking place today. Uh, and so as a result, uh, several of my colleagues um, have commitments to speak at them, otherwise they would have, have been here. Um, so I'll spend a few minutes talking about how we've been able to make use of the uh, resources that are, have been available to the university through its operating budget from the city and the state. Uh, to uh, improved uh, degree completion rates with an eye toward how much better these rates could be and how much faster progress could be um, with uh, if uh, an, uh, additional funding were available. So by making effective use of the resources available to it, CUNY in a relatively short period of time has made remarkable progress in raising its graduation rates. Uh, this has been due to the hard work of our students, our faculty and staff and, and our leadership. Uh, so last year, uh, <coughs> in 2016 to 17, uh, the university awarded 51,533 degrees, uh, up from 47,776 the year before. So that's an increase of 8% overall. But degrees awarded to students of color uh, increased at an even uh, faster pace. So uh, <coughs> uh, if undergraduate degrees in general increased by 12.4%, uh, the uh, number of degrees awarded to students of color increased by 18% uh, over the same uh, period. Um, Three-year graduation rates are another uh, point of, of progress. And the improvement that we've seen in these rates uh, and the improvement that we expect to see going forward uh, is in no small part due to the large investment that the council and the city has made in the ASAP program. Uh, and I'll say a, a bit more about that. But uh, three-year graduation rates uh, from associate programs, this is uh, all of our associate programs, including at our so-called comprehensive colleges, uh, climbed from 13.6% to 19.2% uh, from the entering full-time cohort uh, in 2010 to the co cohort entering in 2014. So over a four-year period, the, the graduation rates uh, increased by almost half in, in just that short period of time. Uh, and we believe that we're on track to achieve the target in the university's uh, strategic plan of, of reaching a 35%, 35.6% a uh, graduation rate for the cohort entering in 2019. 
We chose the 2019 cohort as, a, as a, the basis for that target because that'll be the year when uh, the ASAP program is fully scaled up to 25,000 students, representing almost half of, an, of the entering class of, of associate students. <coughs> um, so back in 2006, just to go back a little bit further than the, uh, to, uh, the 2010 cohort I mentioned, um, the, uh, the graduation rate was only 10% back then. So in, in just not that many years, we've more than uh, doubled the, uh, the, the associate uh, degree graduation rate. And our target is to double it again. Um, for baccalaureate uh, students, we've made progress there as well. A again, keeping in mind the constraints on the resources that we've been operating under that the councilman uh, referenced so eloquently. Six-year graduation rates for baccalaureate uh, students moved from 51% to 56.6% uh, for the entering uh, uh, full-time cohort of fall 2006, comparing that to the fall 2011 cohort. So again, progress of over five percentage points uh, in, in that relatively short period of time. Some of that may be due to uh, rising admission standards, but uh, there's been a tremendous amount of attention you know, paid to supporting students as best we can, uh, improving advisement to, to raise those rates. So more financial resources for our students would, would be welcomed, uh, warmly welcomed, but our, our efforts to, we believe, increase, uh, to change student behavior uh, in terms of the, uh, what, what is seen as a normal credit load, uh, will, can also uh, have, uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, big uh, effects on on-time graduation uh, rates. And it will, it will also help our students maximize the use of financial aid. Uh, TAP is limited to eight semesters, I believe. And so s students who pursue their degrees in an efficient manner and take 15 credits a term we recognize that not every student can do that, but if more students do that, graduation rates on time and better use of, of, of the available financial aid um, uh, should be possible. So uh, the data show that um, students who are full-time now, who increase their credit load from 12 to 15 credits, do not suffer a, a GPA penalty for, for taking on the additional uh, credit, um, uh, additional credit load. Sometimes there's a concern among advisors uh, that, that students are, are taking on too much, but almost no matter what the student's level of high school preparation, uh, they, they're better off taking 15 than 12 credits. It might seem counterintuitive, but, but my IR background is showing that uh, when we do a rigorous study that that seems to be the, the, the pattern. Um, we um, have launched, as a part of our momentum campaign, uh, a systemic communications, uh, a set of communications to our students to encourage them to take 15 credits, making full use of the summer. So it may be not possible for a student to take 15 in the, in the fall and 15 in, in, in the spring, but by making good use of the summer, they can stay on pace to the 30 credit um, 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 degree uh, credit accumulation rate that's necessary to qualify them for the Excelsior scholarship and to make full use of their, their TAP uh, award. So um, the, uh, the efforts in this direction have begun to, to bear fruit. The percentage of full-time undergraduates taking 15 credits uh, in the, uh, uh, the fall increased from 30.6% in fall of 16 to 41% in fall of 17. That's an increase of 10.6 percentage points. So over time, this should uh, show uh, an improvement in uh, re retention and on-time degree completion rates. Uh, at one of our four-year colleges, Hunter, uh, the percentage of new freshmen taking 15 credits in their first semester uh, rose from 30% in 2012 to, to more than 59% two years later through a, a concerted information campaign, working with advisors uh, and uh, changing the, the baseline expectations about what a full-time credit load is from the financial aid definition, 12 credits, to the on-time to degree completion um, uh, definition of 15. <coughs> um, we've also just begun a campaign um, 
to um, encourage students to take advantage of the new Pell benefit uh, for summer course taking. Uh, again, to encourage students who, um, uh, to take the full 30 credits uh, a year uh, by making full use of the summer, Pell will pay for uh, summer uh, coursework. Uh, we, one of the things that we've been uh, working hard at, at, at CUNY is to what we call just-in-time information delivery to students. With the um, investments in the administrative infrastructure that, that we've uh, made over the last number of years um, to uh, uh, have better access to what we call real-time information uh, about our students, uh, we've been able to deliver messages to students um, at, at the time when the, that message, delivery of that message does the most good. Uh, so for example, students are rounding the corner into the summer. Uh, we we're able to identify uh, students who might benefit from taking the additional six credits and send them uh, messaging um, uh, in time for them to change the, maybe make decisions about what they should be doing over, over the summer. Um, because uh, students pay the same tuition for 15 credits as 12, the overall, overall cost of a degree is much more affordable when students take the 15 credits uh, per term. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, it allows them to make full use of, of the TAP award. Um, finally, the, 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 other, the, the other benefit of graduating closer to on time is that students can enter the labor force more quickly or continue their, their studies uh, more expeditiously than before. And again, this, this um, uh, reduces the ultimate cost of, of the degree because students can start earning money more, more quickly um, to pay back many, any loans they may have taken or uh, to basically get on with their, their lives. Another one of the recommendations in the report is um, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is remediation reform. We, uh, the council generously uh, uh, allocated $2 million last year to, to CUNY to support a number of efforts that we've been making uh, on, uh, to make remediation more effective and efficient for, for students who are placed into it. Uh, and um, one of the benefits of that is that I last year, 80% um, of our students in entering our associate programs placed into some form of remediation, reading, writing, or math. Uh, because of changes that we made after a great deal of research uh, uh, into which students really belong in remedial instruction and which students uh, can, can uh, do well by placing directly into credit, that percentage dropped from 80 to 62 percent of, of community college students placing into remedial instruction. 62 percent is still maybe higher than it needs to be, but you know, what we've been doing is working hard at, at designing remediation so that it's more effective than, uh, than it, it was when it consisted largely of a series of non-credit courses, one after another. The problem with those, that, that form of delivery is that there's a great deal of leakage between uh, courses in, in remedial sequences. Failure rates in each course are high, and so way too many students were never making it through to, to uh, credit coursework. So what we've done uh, using the, uh, the council funds and um, uh, thinking hard about, about policy uh, is to better uh, target remedial interventions to the needs of students. So summer immersion, for example, uh, is, is an opportunity to do a better job of, of moving away from one size fits all workshops to ones targeted to the specific skill profile of, of students. Uh, that involved a fair amount of redesign of, of, uh, uh, of summer immersion uh, workshops to, to accomplish that. Students with the greatest needs uh, are being referred to CUNY START or Math START, which both, both programs have tr really good track records in moving students through uh, to uh, skill proficiency. In math, what that means is that students who, uh, who uh, participate in one of those, either of those two programs, uh, and master elementary algebra have the full array of curricular options open to them once they matriculate uh, at, at CUNY. Uh, and then on the, uh, in terms of post-matriculation options, um, what we're doing here is encouraging what we call the co-requisite model of instruction. So this, instead of students being placed into 
uh, a non-credit sequence of, of courses where they have a, a good chance of becoming discouraged, uh, they place into a credit course with extra support. So now when they're taking the extra support, they see the context and the need for that extra support and it's delivered just in time at the point in the regular course when they, they need it. And that's been found both at CUNY and nationally to be a much more effective way of uh, delivering uh, remedial instruction. Uh, so we, uh, we hope to uh, be able to continue uh, that, that work, again, with the uh, assistance of the council. Uh, the, the money uh, goes to uh, uh, a, a, a highly effective set of, of, of interventions that are showing real, real promise. Um, proper advisement, as the report uh, mentions, is essential to starting our students off on the, the right track and keeping them on, on it through to a timely uh, degree completion. Too many students take too many credits, maybe sometimes the wrong credits, uh, because they haven't spent enough time with advisors to make sure that they take the courses that they really need uh, to, um, to complete their degree. Uh, major changing is, is an issue in, 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 as well. And so advisement is, is, is one of the secrets to the ASAP program. I'll mention the, the intrusive advisement model there keeps students uh, on track. Uh, so not only do they take, pursue their careers efficiently, uh, taking the right number of credits, but they take, they take the right credits because of, of that advisement. Um, so, uh, one of the things that CUNY's been able to do, again, given the budgetary constraints, is to give advisors uh, te technological support that they haven't had in the past. Um, <clears throat> so, um, in the community colleges, five of our community colleges now have uh, what we call early alert systems. Starfish is the, uh, the main uh, package. If a student begins to show signs of academic difficulty, uh, the package allows faculty to refer students to uh, support, tutoring support, it might be counseling of various sorts, and then keeps uh, track of whether the students kept those appointments. So it sort of closes the, uh, the student in a, in a technological um, in, uh, uh, web of, of support. The, um, uh, another package, uh, analytics packages, uh, provide a different sort of support to advisors. They're able to um, distill an enormous amount of academic information that's available to them in terms of patterns of course taking and grades that students over a long period of time um, have, um, have uh, uh, demonstrated. And it delivers the, that information directly to the advisor in, in with respect to uh, a, a particular student. So for example, if David Crook um, comes to an advisor and says, gee, I, I'm thinking of, a, of, a, of a, uh, majoring in physics, but my record shows that I got a C plus in physics 101 or in college algebra. Based on the records of, uh, of thousands or hundreds of, of students over time, um, the, um, the advisor might say, well, you know, not necessarily discourage me, but uh, alert me to the, the, the um, uh, some of the um, uh, risk factors associated with my career, uh, with my choice of, of, of major. So we just procured a, 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 an analytics package called EAB for the senior colleges that would perform that function and, and help the advising cores there. It's not to take away from the need for real live advisors for uh, bolstering the um, sometimes uh, small, way too small advising core available to students, especially in the senior colleges. ASAP has made a, a huge difference in the community college advising uh, core. Um, the report uh, uh, advocates for closer connections to the DOE uh, to ease the transition from high school uh, to, to college. Um, I won't go into detail with probably the programs that you are pretty familiar with, but CUNY has been out front and a leader in dual enrollment uh, programs, the College Now program for decades. Uh, and um, that program serves 22,000 students uh, now. And uh, a growing percentage of freshmen at CUNY uh, have had experience with College Now. And the record shows that those students have higher grades and accumulate more credits than students who haven't had the benefit of College Now, even for uh, controlling for high school background. 
the, uh, the LINKED program, a senior year program to pro provide remediation is now in over 90 schools. Uh, again, thanks to funding from the city and that's showing promising results. Um, <coughs> we've um, for 10 years have had a two-way data exchange with the public schools, which has allowed the two institutions to uh, communicate more effectively than they would have about what makes students ready for college um, and what uh, informs uh, skill proficiency standards and college admission standards. And that's been a healthy uh, channel of communication over, over time. But much more work needs to be done. Too many students who um, have a, who apply uh, to college um, and, and follow through um, with um, uh, being uh, filing an, an admission and, and beginning the process uh, change their mind and for whatever reason uh, through a process that we call college uh, summer melt uh, don't show up e uh, at college either at CUNY or elsewhere and so that's um, work that we know uh, needs to be done to to uh, smooth that that transition and to make sure that students who can benefit from a college education um, uh, take advantage of it New York City has an unusually high college going rate in part because uh, of the efforts that the two institutions have already made to, to raise college going rates. One thing uh, that we do know has made a difference in college going here in New York is the, uh, uh, the application fee waiver uh, program that, the, uh, that was funded uh, last year with $2 million provided by the, by the city. Uh, according to an analysis that, that uh, the public schools did, 75% um, of DOE graduates applied to CUNY uh, in 2017. Uh, uh, that's up from 71.5% uh, the year before. And we think that the application waivers uh, may, may have made a difference. Uh, and also the freshman class at CUNY um, is, is higher than it's ever been. It climbed last fall to, to over 38,000 students. Uh, it's, as I, I said, a historic high. It's up 3.4 percent, over, over 1,200 uh, students from the fall before. And that 1,259 students uh, are almost entirely made up of graduates of the New York, <coughs> New York City public schools. Another uh, area of concern in, in the uh, task force report uh, is the uh, struggle that our, many of our students have to pay for college. Uh, we uh, acknowledge that uh, it is a, a challenge for the many students who come from the low income families that I, I cited at the beginning. 42% of our students come from households uh, earning less than uh, $20,000 a year. Um, <coughs> so. You know, how can we support these students uh, better than we have? Well, one thing we need to keep in mind, and, and as the report points out, that, that tuition isn't the whole story. Living expenses, even for the, many, the majority of our students who live with their parents, are about $17,000 a, a year. So tuition doesn't solve the, the problem. Um, there's still the need for uh, uh, many of our students to work or, or borrow to afford their, uh, their education. Um, but we do know that about 65% uh, of our full-time resident undergraduates are able to attend uh, tuition-free. Uh, that's 61% uh, at the senior colleges and 71% at the community colleges. So that's between TAP and Pell. Uh, their, their income is low enough and those awards are high enough to cover the entire cost of, of tuition at CUNY. Uh, which is $6,530 at the senior colleges and $4,800 uh, in the community colleges. Um, so eight, uh, because uh, financial aid is relatively generous, and, and I haven't mentioned Excelsior yet, um, and because tuition is comparatively low, um, Eight and ten of our students uh, gra um, who graduate graduate free of federal loan debt, um, so that enables them to continue uh, uh, their um, schooling. It makes graduate school more affordable because they're they're finishing their undergraduate degree uh, with little or, or no debt. Of those who did borrow, uh, the the twenty percent who did borrow. The average debt is uh, uh, in 2017 was $11,700. Uh, 
um, 12,700 for the four-year schools, 8,900 for the two-year schools. Um, in total, CUNY students received more than a billion dollars in federal, state, and city financial aid this, this past year. And that doesn't count the um, aid from private uh, funds as, as well uh, for scholarships. Um, Excelsior um, is, you know, as, as um, Steve Breyer mentioned, is a, is a last dollar in uh, award. So it, it makes up the difference between TAP and Pell and, and tuition for students who, who need, need that. And um, the um, um, number of students at CUNY who received an Excelsior Award was 4,700 uh, in fall of 17. So it was more than uh, double, not to take issue with the report, but it was more than double the, the, the number uh, estimated in, in the report from, from last fall before all the data were, were in. Um, so uh, in fall, fiscal uh, 2018, students were paying out of pocket about $750,000 in tuition. Uh, and um, so um, $750 million in tuition, sorry. Uh, of, of the total $3.5 billion budget, tax levy budget, 22% 20, in, in that fiscal year was made up of, of, of tuition uh, payments by, by students. Um, I wanted to say a word about the importance of emergency funds, another one of the recommendations. We know that uh, the uh, Petrie Foundation has been generous since in offering support for emergency funds. We know how vulnerable students can be to minor uh, expenses unforeseen that can uh, disrupt uh, their, their, uh, their schooling. I mean, back earlier in my career, we did a, um, a study of students of, of uh, excellent students who, who dropped out and did uh, an interview study to find out why, why good students with excellent GPAs left, left uh, uh, discontinued their studies. And overwhelmingly, it was for financial reasons. It might be um, a, a medical emergency, it might be a need to take care of a relative, um, uh, but, and for relatively small amounts of money. So emergency funds can make a, a, a large difference. The report mentions the Assist Me app uh, at Kingsborough, which um, uh, students can uh, um, enter and, and uh, signal uh, needs that they need for, for student services. Research associated with the development of that app showed that many students at Kings, Kingsborough, and this is true everywhere, uh, were, uh, had left uh, uh, the, the university uh, for relatively small amounts of, of money. And this is important for recruiting adult students coming back to CUNY, students who may have left for a while. Many of them owe relatively small amounts of money and they need to clear it up with a bursar. Um, so th these are all uh, points where um, a little bit of funding can, could do a lot of good in terms of removing small financial hurdles to, to degree completion. Um, this last year, and again this year, uh, CUNY received $4 million from New York State for uh, open education resources. So these are um, resources that are, uh, t are textbooks and uh, materials used in class that, for which students don't have to pay an arm and a leg to publishers uh, for, for uh, uh, commercial textbooks. They're developed by faculty from around the world and at CUNY as well. And so the money goes to, uh, to develop the materials, to, uh, to store them, and to make them available to students. Uh, last year, the $4 million investment saved our students $8 million. So there's, there's tremendous um, potential here for, for that investment. Um, the, um, you know, just to say a bit about um, career, uh, the work that the university is doing to prepare students for the, uh, the labor market. Um, we, um, our data have gotten much better uh, on uh, what happens to our students once they enter the labor market. We, we uh, reached an agreement with the New York State uh, Department of Labor to obtain unemployment insurance records. And so we have data now on where our students are employed. The, the good news is almost all of them remain in New York City and New York State and uh, the enhanced earnings that they have from uh, graduation rates, including the higher ones that I just cited go f uh, to increase tax revenue. So taxpayers benefit from the investment in higher education because our students graduate and stay in the, in the, the local economy and they earn more than they would have. 
So we're working hard now to strengthen our career centers. Um, we, we have a dynamic uh, uh, addition to our staff who um, is uh, pursuing creative solutions to uh, um, link up uh, employers to, with, to, to students to enhance their career opportunities, to in increase paid internships. Um, uh, one part of the strategy is to hire uh, a group of wh what she calls sector navigators. These are specialists in a certain area of the local economy that can help connect employers to our students. So the uh, task force, I'd like to you know, add my uh, commendations to the authors of the report. Uh, uh, the, work, the task force has obviously done its work uh, carefully. Uh, it has spotlighted key opportunities for in, uh, additional investments in our students. You know, I've tried to make the point that, you know, given the framework, the budgetary framework that we've operated in over the last number of years, we've still been able to make uh, remarkable uh, progress. Uh, but additional investments could accelerate that progress, could uh, um, improve working conditions for our faculty, and classroom conditions for our students. Um, and accelerate the uh, progress that we've already seen in raising uh, graduation rates. Um, uh, this concludes my testimony, but uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, thank you very much. It's been very comprehensive and it's generated a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so I'll start and then if uh, my colleague has questions, I'll ask him to share them. So you said that in 2016, the number of students, I think you said, the number of students taking 15 credits rose from 30.6% to 41%. So from that 2016 to 2017, uh, that's correct. The number of full-time freshmen at CUNY, meaning they, they were taking 12 already, right. um, uh, rose by 10 percentage points. What yeah. impact did that have on their GPAs? None, uh, on average, none. Uh, okay. the, the GPA stayed just about the, the same. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, so my questions are not in order because I, no. I wrote them. The Excelsior Scholarship recipients, you said there are 4,700. Do you have the dollar amount that these uh, students received? I've been told that sometimes they're very negligible amounts, as low as $18. Uh, I don't have those uh, those figures for you. I think that'll be the first thing that I have to promise to get back to you with. Okay. Uh, but what we do know is that the amount is calibrated to students' income. And okay. <coughs> I, I would love to see those numbers. You talked about the remediation initiative, and I'm not quite clear um, Average, I just found okay. um, a figure here that the average Excelsior award was two thousand four hundred and fifty-four dollars. Is that right? Okay. Okay, so it varies some by school, uh, depending on the average, because our schools vary in terms of the average income level of the right. students. You know, the average award that they receive over mm -hmm. and above their TAP and Pell. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate that, and if you could give us the breakdown of what, sure. what they are, I would appreciate that. Um, you talked about the remediation initiative, and I wasn't quite clear. I, I thought I heard you say it had been 80% uh, that needed remediation, and that went down to 62%? Yes, so uh, of all of the students entering our associate programs, um, 80% had needed remediation of one form or another, reading, writing, or math, in 2016. The, ne the next year, um, <clears throat> so what, what had happened is that all of the tools that we've been using to place students into or out of remediation changed in, in, in one year uh, because of a uh, move by the state and by the college board uh, to uh, recalibrate their assessments in, in accord with the Common Core State Standards. So we had new Regents exams in, in math and English. Uh, the college, the SAT uh, changed, uh, the scaling changed, um, and we had been using a, a bank of placement tests called COMPASS to place students uh, who weren't right. proficient based on the SAT or the Regents into uh, remediation or out of it. and. Uh, 
the company that publishes Compass uh, pulled the test from the market. So we, we switched over for the time being to a, a new package called AccuPlacer. Uh, and so that gave us the opportunity to do a series of studies to determine who can succeed, uh, where, where should we set the cut points on these different markers to separate students who really need remediation from those who could do just fine if they were placed directly into credit. Most of the change took place with respect to mathematics. So we placed fewer students into math remediation than we did the year before and more directly into, uh, it could be statistics, it could be um, 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 <coughs> um, quantitative reasoning or, or uh, college algebra. So we can't really make a true comparison in the numbers in that sharp decline because we use a different measurement, we had a different standard. It's, that, that, that's, it's a true comparison in that it has a real effect on the, uh, the lives of our students. Uh, many more students um, <coughs> uh, succeeded in their credit-bearing math courses uh, than, than had been bef uh, the case before. So what I, what I mean by that, just to be a little more precise, is that we, we placed more students into credit-bearing math than the year before. Um, okay. The average grade point average grades, uh, percent earning a C or better, went down a, a few percentage points, but so many more students placed directly into credit that they were able to continue their career, satisfy their general education requirements in, in mathematics, and move, move on into the, into the curriculum. That, that's interesting, that's interesting. Um, I'd like to think about that a little more and we can talk about it sure. again. I have some, I, some thoughts about that. You said that uh, about 75% of New York City graduates apply to CUNY. 75% uh, of the entering freshman class, 78% came, came from the okay. DOE. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, the number, I think I did give you that 75% number um, of, of DOE graduates applied uh, to CUNY. Okay. Uh, and because we think partly because of the, of the, the waiver, the application waiver. And so of, of those students from DOE, because I always feel that um, their college ready index is not quite what it should be. They mm -hmm. think they call it the college ready index. Of those students who come from DOE, Department of Education schools, how, what percentage would you say still need remediation? Is that back to the 62? Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's close to 62. There's not that much difference between the um, parochial schools and the public schools. That's there really isn't. In terms of remediation from private schools, appropriate schools, and yeah, public not, schools? Not, not on average, a little bit, but not, that, not on average. Okay. And what percent of the students who come to CUNY come from paro parochial or private schools in New York? Well, it, it's less than 10%. I think it's, uh, it's around 10%. Um, I'm looking at uh, my colleague, Laura Bruno, uh, in case she knows, mm -hmm. but I, yeah. I think that's and so now you said 61% of students in, in uh, community colleges graduate tuition free and 71% in senior colleges graduate tuition free. And the average is 11,700 in low terms low. of those who graduate That's with right. debt. Yep. Do we have a number for the students who leave before graduation? So and have, have debt? So, so no, I, I don't have those numbers, but I, I just wanted to correct okay. what I said. So, so eight and 10 percent of our eight, eight and 10 of our graduates graduate free of federal loan debt. Okay. So it's eight and 10. Um, and um, what the, the other numbers that I cited were the percentage of students who uh, attend tuition free. Uh, so that's 61% at the senior colleges. Who attend, attend tuition free. Attend tuition oh, free yes. and 71% okay. at the community colleges. Okay, okay. Um, and then, the, and yes, the average uh, debt of those who did borrow, the 20% who did borrow was $11,700. Uh, right. I have other questions, but I'm going to ask my colleague, yeah. Councilmember Holden. Thank, th thanks, Provost, for your uh, testimony. 
It was, it was very complete, by the way. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it went on so long. No, that was good. It was good. It was very good. Fifteen credits. Um, I always would um, try to urge my students to take at least fifteen credits, but I ran into obstacles. And, and as you know, you mentioned about the household income. Many of my students worked, and they always said, "Well, I can't. I, I could barely take twelve credits, but I have to get my tap, so I need twelve credits. I can't take fifteen. And that was the biggest hurdle that I had. But the, the next biggest hurdle um, for students getting their 12 credits or 15 credits was, was the lack of course offerings in their major. And right at the same time, we had a lot of, uh, the state cut off some of our funding and we had a lot of courses canceled or they, the courses didn't have enough students in them, they wouldn't let them run. If they had 12 or 13, they said, no, you can't run a class. So the student couldn't get their course to, to graduate or they couldn't get um, a course in their major. Yet, at the same time, the registrar started to clamp down on course substitutions, which is, again, counterproductive because if you let the department handle the course substitutions to a degree, obviously there has to be some controls, but if, if a student, through no fault of their own, could not get the course that they registered for because it was canceled or not offered in that particular semester and held them back from graduating or getting the 12 credits, which is quite, it, it happened quite often and, and, and to actually most students. So why can't we have some kind of, you know, um, I think consideration for students who are, through no fault of their own, denied that course to have them graduate on time or to get TAP even, and, and allow the departments to make some decisions. It's a valid point. You know, the, the data you know, show that um, while it's not so much, of course availability is not so much of an issue at the community colleges, it's more of an issue at some of the senior colleges, and you're right that it's more likely to be in the major, uh, courses needed for the major than in general edu education. And so, uh, you know, I think that there's a provision in the Excelsior scholarships um, that um, if the colleges can't offer the courses that the students need to maintain the 30 credit a year uh, pace, that, that the, the burden of that falls uh, back to, to uh, the, uh, the colleges. <coughs> um, but um, the university has an obligation. Uh, if we're going to encourage students to take 30 credits a year, uh, to offer the courses, uh, and uh, if, if we want students to graduate on time, uh, the courses need to be available. So one, one way uh, that, um, to think about that is, is offering more courses online or partly online so that if the course isn't available at the home college, the student might be able to take it some other, other, other at another college. Um, the permit system is, a, is another uh, underused resource that would allow students to take a course not available at their own college, uh, to take it at another CUNY college. Um, there the, the barrier is that students don't know about that option. Uh, it's not w well publicized a, a enough right now. Um, we've made a, a, a one leap forward in the last year by creating a university-wide course catalog so that it's much easier for students to search for a, a course that they need. Um, anywhere in the university and uh, identify whether, you know, how it's being offered, whether it's online or at a time when, when they can take it. Yeah, I agree the permit isn't advertised and it should be because I, I did that when I went to uh, CUNY. Um, you said there were 4,000 students received Excelsior, Is, was that correct, yes. in CUNY? Uh, at CUNY, yes, yeah. 4,700. That's a low number actually, isn't it? 4,700, yes. 47, that's pretty low though. Um, how do we raise that? How do we get the word out or at least uh, well, try to get more students? The number will increase um, uh, with each incoming class that you know, has a chance to register from day one for the minimum uh, number of credits that, that they need. Um, another way to raise it is to target students who maybe have 24 credits by the end of, the, of their first spring, but not the 30 they need to keep the scholarship. So it's the communications campaign that I mentioned to encourage students to make up the, 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 um, the 30 through uh, summer course taking. Um, and um, you know, um, th those would be you know, probably the two main, uh, main ways to, to start taking 30 right from day year one and then keep that pace up through till to, to degree completion. 
Okay, one final, I just wanted a, a, a summary. So on the course substitutions, or at least if a student is denied a course through no fault of their own to graduate or to get to 12 at TAP, um, and they take any course, and they're not eligible for TAP after that. And um, don't should the re university respect, you know, actually have some responsibility, bear some responsibility, and like you mentioned in the Excelsior program, sh could could you your office look at possibly having th more flexibility in course substitutions, or at least bear some have the university bear some responsibility for that? Well, you know, I'm not in a position to take a position on that, but but I can certainly I know what we're what we're doing to try to to ameliorate that situation, which are the steps that I've I've, I've mentioned. It's in the 2016 to 20 master plan and in the uh, CUNY strategic framework to try to to ease this issue of course availability. It's a problem that we've we've recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Just a few more questions. You, you just said that if a student had completed 24 credits, uh, you might encourage them to do the six so that they could meet the Excelsior requirement. Yes. Would they have to pay for the summer school? Would they have to pay that um, session? TAP does not cover summer tuition, but Pell okay. may. Uh, okay. And um, depending on the students, not, there's quite a few sort of complicated regulations around that. And so the, our communications campaign encourages students to come see their financial aid officer. So someone will sit and work with them and try to get them. If we have enough financial aid officers, that's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have, I have um, a chart. I'm, I don't know if these graduation rates are accurate, but um, for the senior colleges, you said CUNY-wide, it's 57%, I think you said, for a six-year yeah, Yes, 56.6 50, in 50, six years. Right, I rounded it off to 57. Mm -hmm. But in, in those uh, senior colleges, there's a high of, according to what I have here, 75% completion for one school and a low of about 27%. What kind of interactions or a collegial exchange is going on, or are there particular issues where the graduation rate at one school is so low, or what kind of collegial exchanges or instructors giving with each other, sharing with each other to get these graduation rates up? 27 it's, it's, low. It's, yeah. And again, there may be lots of reasons why people may have decided uh, to take or if they may need another semester or another semester, six may not be adequate. We, this last year, we launched what we've called the Momentum Campaign um, <clears throat> that has three uh, pillars that we hope will raise graduation rates everywhere, at the lower performing schools and even at the, uh, the ones that boast of the 75%. Everybody can be, even the ones who get, have a 75% degree completion rate in six years might have a higher on time degree completion rate than, than they do. And mm -hmm. the momentum campaign consists of three uh, 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 pieces. You know, one is to move students through to what we call the gateway courses, the, the, the key first level credit courses in math uh, and in English uh, more quickly. And, and to, to, to too many students, especially in math, procrastinate in taking their, their first math course. And we know that that's correlated with degree completion. So, and then in, in the associate programs, part of, of completing a higher percentage or completing gateway courses on time in the first year is getting through remediation more efficiently. So that's wrapped up in remediation reform. But uh, so gateway course completion is, is part of it. The moment, the, the credit taking campaign uh, to encourage students to take 15 rather than 12. And even if, they're part-time, then it may be encouraging them to go to full-time. Um, so that's a communications campaign. And then degree mapping is really the glue that holds it all together. Um, st degree maps are a plan that semester by semester that the advisor uh, creates with the student so that the student knows exactly which courses he or she needs to take to get through um, to meet the requirements uh, on, uh, in a timely fashion. 
uh, we've just finished a huge investment in, in a degree, uh, a piece of software called DegreeWorks that um, uh, does an audit on what courses the student still needs to take to, to complete the degree and then helps with the, the planning uh, part of it. So, so not, do so all not, students have that ability to sit with someone or is it, you know, guided online things that you can do? How, how does it, is I, the I one? It, it's um, subject, of course, to the size of the advising staff that's available, mm -hmm. but I think students early in their career have access to a professional advising corps at most colleges. Uh, and then once they reach the uh, junior year, uh, uh, advisement responsibilities move over to the to the faculty in the in the in the major. But mm -hmm. um, w the colleges uh, have generally made a commitment to uh, having the student work with a live advisor, over, with the degree works uh, uh, software in, in hand, uh, to to do this this pl uh, planning and then to make changes on a semester basis if the student withdraws from a course or changes their major. So that's, that's okay. Any further yeah, questions? just um, one follow-up question on Excelsior. How many students um, were rejected from the, the program? Um, that I don't know. Um, I mean, I think it, it would be nobody's rejected on grounds except um, uh, initially, at least, um, uh, on, on the basis of their their income level. They may, if they have too high an income. Um, or if all of their uh, the expenses are already met by TAP and PAL, then they wouldn't be eligible for Excelsior. Mm -hmm. um, um, we don't have data yet on the number of students who earned 15 credits in their first term but then didn't keep up the pace mm -hmm. in their first year. The summer's not over yet, and so uh, you know, remember the quote is 30 credits over, over a whole year, and, and so the first year hasn't elapsed yet, we'll, we'll know next fall how many students maybe started out on track to, re, to be for, to eligibility and then lost it. Okay. And I do have one follow-up question. Uh, how is the topic of implementing a tuition-free policy or the recommendations in this report broached when interviewing or vetting potential university chancellors? Is that a part of what that broad well, spectrum I, would be? I, I wish I was part of the search committee, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I and tried. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happens in those conversations. Okay. But, uh, okay. Uh, I think that, that completes the questions that I had. Thank you so much you for your testimony. And we'll call the next panel. Okay. And we're going to put people on the clock. Uh, well, oh, no, no, that's because we grilled them because they've got all the data, you know. Uh, and we want to make sure we give them as much time as they need. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to put people on the clock. Uh, Cyril, oh boy, help me pronounce your name. NJ, NJK? Say it for me, please. Njiken. Njiken, okay. Um, Kwatha Abdullah and Jamel Henderson. So we'll give each of you three minutes on the clock. I know it's a short time, but we'll ask that you uh, try to adhere to that time limit. If you'd raise your hand. Well, you don't, we don't have to do it with both of the students. Okay, just give us your name and um, your testimony. Thank you. to the Higher Education Committee and the members of the, of the New York City Council. My name is Kothar Abdullah. I'm a student government center at the Bar of Manhattan Community College, not far away from here. I, uh, I also currently serve as a vice chair for disability affairs for the CUNY University Student Senate. As a first generation Arab immigrant woman from Yemen, I never thought that one day I'd be sitting here as a college student. I will be graduating with my associate's degree in liberal arts this Friday. I will continue my education at the City College of New York, where I was accepted to the Skadden Arps Honors Program. While at City College, 
I will double major in political science and international relations. For the average New Yorker, this may, this may not be a big deal. As an immigrant coming from a village deep in the Yemeni suburbs, where war has inflated the towns and the educational opportunities depleted, depleted, I consider myself lucky. My native country doesn't promote intellectual curiosity or see educational opportunities as a right. Instead, they are viewed as a luxury. Here at CUNY, education is a right and somewhat affordable. However, if CUNY continues to raise the tuition or the, or the conditions remain the way they currently are, then I and many others will not be able to afford to go to school. At times, I feel that the idea of me becoming a lawyer is a, is, is a far-fetched opportunity, not because of access, but the everlasting increasing tuition. Most of the people I represent and come to love question the fate of their future. Many of their difficulties are lack of socioeconomic opportunities and foundational support. Knowing what I know now, people like me do have the intellect and will to succeed, but the lacks of means and access. Having insufficient funds and lack of guidance, can we genuinely continue to wonder why so many of our problems have become so impalpable? Many individual talents are wasted because they have been compromised to choose less desired alternative routes. CUNY students are mostly people of color, and they felt like not having affordable access to higher education, the continued divestment in our, in our facilities and faculty is a direct attack on us. We must not forget tuition hikes makes it harder for low-income students to enroll or even complete college. Most of my classmates are full-time students and work two jobs to support themselves. The unwillingness to fully support higher education adds more to their worries and is not the way to make colleges more accessible or affordable. The 500 plus students and I deserve quality, affordable, better yet free education. We are the future generation of leaders and it is in the best interest of New York to make CUNY free. Thank you. Good morning to the members of City Council, Higher Education Committee, led by the Honorable Inez Barron, to the professors who choose to go above and beyond in educating the right now of our great city to move forward, and most importantly, to the 500,000 plus students and the millions of alums across this world, I say to you, good morning. My name is Jamel Henderson, and I am a proud three-time CUNY graduate receiving degrees from the Borough of Manhattan Community College, Brooklyn College, Baruch, and now working on my second master's at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm here also to stand before you as a proud resident of NYCHA's Kingsborough Houses, where I have attained all these degrees as a resident. CUNY means the world to me, and I'm proud of the wealth of knowledge that I have attained thus far. But I want us to be clear, CUNY is not perfect. And it is so important that I address this amazing committee on the importance and vitality of keeping our great university on the premises of being truly free for everyone to attend. There are many prospective and current students who are here for a common goal, and that is to graduate. However, the resources that are available to help such students are not properly funded nor advertised to the general student body or to the public. It can be very intimidating to think about graduation if you are in real life circumstances that can cause you to give up. Circumstances like being in foster care, dealing with the loss of a loved one, living on your own and making tough decisions whether I'm going to use the money to pay rent or to pay for classes. Let's not forget what happens on campus as students like myself who have experienced hunger but have to smile because we don't want to be seen as someone who is desperate. In fact, right now, there is someone on campus in the City University of New York who are planning how to hide from public safety to ensure that they have a safe place to rest their head. All of these circumstances lead to one thing, accountability and responsibility. It is so important that our great city and state governments be honest when working alongside with CUNY with the people whom we've elect to show us how CUNY is helping our students to achieve that pinnacle of the academic journey. All students deserve access to every resource available to help them to achieve their goal. It should no longer be hidden from the public. 
We need to make sure that our great university is absolutely supported academically and financially. CUNY has the best professors anywhere in any university in this world, period. It is also very crucial that our city and state treat them as such, for they work very hard to teach us to learn the world in a very unique way. Many professors develop lifelong bonds with us because they invest in us in such a way that our communities can't compare to the love and support we receive. Finally, our campuses must be upgraded to be in comp top competition with our fellow private universities that we cannot afford. Our greatest resource is the city and state government, and we cannot play political games when it comes to the academic livelihood and space that we will be a part of for years to come as we strive to be the absolute best. I am asking that you stand with us, the 500,000 plus students, and the millions of alums across this world to truly invest in the greatest city university in the world. For there is no sacrifice, there is no victory. Thank you. Thank you. Greeting Councilwoman Barron and committee members on higher education. My name is Cyril Njiken and I'm a graduate student at City College of New York. I serve as a vice chair for graduate student affairs for the City University of New York University Student Senate, also known as, also known as CUNY USS. CUNY USS is a student governance organization responsible for representing the interests of the nearly 500,000 students that attend CUNY each academic year. During my time at City College as a graduate student and at Lehman College as an undergraduate, I've been to many rallies, press conferences, and hearings where CUNY's funding was a topic of conversation. Most of the time, we're talking about tuition hikes, budget cuts, service being cut, buildings falling apart, or our professors being underpaid. I'm happy because today, we're flipping the script and speaking about a real investment in CUNY. We're talking about fundamentally changing the system so that we don't have to come to City Hall or travel to Albany every other month to advocate for the education we truly deserve. I want to thank Councilwoman Ines Baron and every member of this great you know, New York City Council Task Force on tuition-free CUNY for working hard to produce a blueprint for a tuition-free CUNY. This is what our students need and truly deserve. We all know CUNY's rich history. Our university was free. And that provided opportunities for a lot of New Yorkers. We have some of them in the room, actually. Um, we, have some, we have seen nothing but budget cut since they decided to make CUNY a paid institution. Since then, just this year, we have not only seen our tuition go up, We've also seen the CUNY Board of Trustees adopt a number of excellency fees for certain programs. In one case at Brooklyn College, students in the MFA program were hit with an excellency fee that cost almost as much as their tuition. And yet, we know all that Brooklyn College is the same school that is in such dis disrepair that the student nicknamed, the, nicknamed him Broken College. Like I said, we have to begin to change the conversation. We have to imagine a different way and to be pro proactive about it. The council's tax force gives us the blueprint. These are the things that we need as New Yorkers in our public college. Our students need a tuition-free model, and it's not impossible. We had it before. We are at risk of continuing the decades-long trend in divestment of public higher education. What we need is a real investment in public higher education. We need co a commitment from our governor and legislator that our students and professors are a priority to the great state of New York. We can make a real investment in CUNY by adopting a tuition-free funding model. And it's not impossible because we had it not too long ago. We can make a real investment by paying our faculty a living wage and providing more full-time faculties we can make a real investment by providing working families with support services such as childcare, additional counseling services, transportation assistance, and counseling services. Thank you, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. We always appreciate the testimonies of those who are the students and are the ones that are most directly impacted by what it is that CUNY courses are offered. So we thank you for your testimony.
and be encouraged. We, we expect you to be a lawyer, and you can come back and tell us how successful you are when you get that degree. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last panel is Emily Skydell, Evan Ipok, and Jamie Farberwitz. If there are any other person who wished to testify, you should have filled out a slip because this is the last panel. Hello, thank you so much um, for giving us the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Emily Skydell. I'm the Higher Education Coordinator um, for the New York Public Interest Research Group. We're the statewide nonpartisan nonprofit organization that was founded by college students in 1973 to engage peers in civic life. Um, we thank the council member, um, Inez Barron, and the task force for drafting this comprehensive um, and detailed account of what a free and fully funded CUNY can look like. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the um, of our board chair and board reps that are um, right now uh, getting ready to go on a on a retreat uh, board retreat. So I'm here on their behalf. Um, so investing in degree completion and college success are a necessity for thriving in economy and democracy. Um, that's something that everybody in this room knows. Um, and you know, SUNY found that for every dollar spent on education, the economy actually reaps five dollars in benefits. Um, in New York City. 20 of the 25 fastest growing occupations that pay over 50,000 annually require a college degree. Um, so it's very clear that in order to be successful in this, in this state, you, you need a college degree. Um, and a mere 19% of Bronx residents, for example, over the age of 25 hold a bachelor's degree. Um, and among the nation's 100 largest counties, this is the second lowest rate. Um, mm -hmm. So this is incredibly important that, that we're here today talking about this. Um, so free tuition for full-time and part-time students. Um, we all know that with the continuation of rational tuition, the state and city are continuing to rely on students and families to cover budget shortfalls. Um, so you know, free tuition for part-time students is, is incredibly essential as well. The Excelsior Scholarship TAP, free tuition through programs like ASAP, they're only offered to full-time students. We've heard from many students who are parents, have jobs, other responsibilities that don't allow them to take on a full-time course load. So NYPIRC supports the task force recommendation to eliminate all tuition charges for full-time and part-time students enrolled across the CUNY system, um, as well as the costs associated with college um, uh, that can be a barrier to college completion. Um, th these are essential, and that's why um, we support the, the task force's um, emphasis on expanding ASAP. Um, we all know that that program has tremendous success. Um, so, but, but the real thing here is um, that, that I wanted to emphasize that I don't think is talked about enough is connecting students in need with programs um, that are built to serve them. Too many students that we talk to find out about the programs that they need far too late. After speaking with students across CUNY, we've noticed that many students are unaware of programs like ASAP until they are already enrolled in CUNY, at which point it is too late to enroll, and in many cases, uh, in many cases. And according to the ASAP website, um, one of the eligibility requirements is a student must have no more than 15 college credits. Um, this puts students in a tough spot. Uh, they're out of reach of a program that they need. Meanwhile, um, a lot of students come from very poor districts that maybe don't have the, the proper um, support advisors to, to help them connect to these programs um, before it's too late. So um, we have students that have trouble finding out about ASAP, um, as well as even childcare resources. One student at Brooks Community College, Melissa Estrella, she dropped out of school for a while. She had no knowledge of the child care center on her campus. Um, and it took her 10 years to get her community college degree at Bronx Community College. Um, meanwhile, it only costs $5 um, uh, a day at the child care center at Bronx Community College. So um, we really thank you for, cons for thinking about um, expanding advisement as, and counseling as a key um, feature in, in this transitionary period between high school and college so students don't miss out on all these opportunities and all these programs that you guys put so much energy into funding. Um, so I don't want to take up more of your time. Um, you can read the rest of the testimony. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> 
thank you, Chairwoman Barron, for your time. And I want to offer, so for the record, a short anecdote about why this report is really crucially important for students. Um, hello, my name is Evan Ipok, and I'm a sophomore at the Borough of Manhattan Community College and a uh, newly elected board director of the New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, just to give a bit of background on myself, I moved to Harlem from a rural island in Alaska called Sitka to pursue my dreams of studying for a bachelor's degree in political science and eventually undertake the exciting challenge of law school. Little did I know that pursuing my educational dreams would come at quite the cost that it did. I pay nearly $13,000 a year working multiple part-time jobs simultaneously in order to attend a community college that quite ironically touts the fact that it is a machine for social mobility. Over the past year, I have come to love CUNY for its caring and compassionate staff, driven and inspiring students, and the unique opportunities that it serves us. This is why I'm so devastated to say that if the issue of raising tuition at senior colleges is not addressed, the idea of continuing my education becomes a more and more distant reality. I stand in front of you not only as a second generation American citizen via Johannesburg, South Africa, but also as a gay man. Access to higher education is imperative for the people of my communities because not only are we underrepresented in basically every facet of society, but you only need to look to people such as Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin, locally City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, and community organizations such as the Gay Men's Health Crisis, SAGE, and Stonewall Foundation to see how effective and successful we can be under seemingly unbearable pressure. The individuals that make up the gay, lesbian, bi, and trans community have accomplished amazing and unheard of feats, despite the disproportionate injustices of poverty and legal oppression that we face. So imagine what we could do with the wind of the city and state at our backs in the form of legitimate access to free higher education. With that being said, I implore all concerned parties to do everything in their power to make this report public in order to ensure that underserved individuals who might follow in mine and my colleagues' footsteps are able to do so with the full support of both the city and the state of New York. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jamie Farbwitz. I am an English major at the College of Staten Island and a NYPIRC student leader. I am a part of the 2018 to 2019 CUNY Service Corps cohort and intend to pursue public office one day. Thank you for holding this hearing since it is so important that CUNY be made free again. Unfortunately, I don't receive any financial aid. I don't bother filling out FAFSA anymore because I've never qualified. I have two brothers who only got about $10 each from TAP when they were both in college. My parents helped me pay for my tuition, but paying for textbooks, anything else school-related or transportation is on me, and I am expected to pay my tuition, pay money them back for my tuition. Um, textbook money is needed all at once, and there is no way to estimate price. I don't bother telling my parents that to save for textbooks I don't eat because they already pay so much for me to go to school. Transportation is a constant effusion of money. I also have loans from when I went to SUNY Albany. I transferred to CSI to help my parents out with the household because they are older and also disabled. I am disabled too, physically and mentally, but I cannot apply for disability to ease my financial burdens because if you make over $2,000 a month, even at a part-time job, you cannot receive SSI. In a high-cost city like New York, that would basically be forcing myself into poverty. As a trans male, I have experienced challenges maintaining housing stability at times as well. Homelessness is a serious issue among the LGBT community where it is harder to access support from blood relations emotionally and financially. Though I came back to Staten Island to help my household, I have also been kicked out of the house temporarily with the threat of permanently being kicked out during crucial time periods like finals week. This has affected my academic success. If I could save my money from my job as a college assistant for an apartment nearby instead of paying for college, I could do what I have to with chores and leave without relying on them financially or worrying about shelter over my head. 
a year before I would be graduating with my parents paying my tuition, I would be out of luck if they cut me off completely. I would have to expend all and all my energy on day-to-day -day living expenses and wouldn't be able to afford school. I can't do manual labor and minimum wage is simply not enough to live on. If tuition, textbooks, and transportation were free and accessible for all college students, it would help so many LGBTQ plus students like me as well as other students who don't have stable family support. I wrote this um, earlier, but as an addition, um, I also have a friend who had to drop out because her abusive mother withheld information to fill out FAFSA. So if tuition were free in the first place, then that she wouldn't have had to drop out of school and she would have been able to afford going. Free CUNY can ultimately save people from toxic family environments and provide an escape route that simultaneously betters a person. I hope that you all will keep that in mind when considering what a tuition-free CUNY really means for someone. Thank you for your time and also my job as an office assist, as a college assistant is um, all under the Office of Academic Support. So I help with remedial English. If you have any questions about that, I can help. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Again, we always appreciate hearing from firsthand testimony of people who are experiencing what it is that we're trying to develop policy on. So thank you for your testimony. And we do have one last person. Uh, did you have any questions, Councilman Holden? Okay. Uh, the last person to give testimony is John Adorama. You can come up. We're ready to hear from you. No, I'm not here yet. I didn't know I was going to be responding. Oh, well, then he'll have to, he'll, we'll be glad to receive his testimony. He okay. can forward it to us and we'll make sure that it's added as a part of the record. Uh, thank you so much, all of you who stayed, and it's been a very lengthy hearing, but I think it's been very productive. I'm really glad that we have this task force report. I again commend all of the people who did. I'd say Barbara Bowen was one of the uh, one of the team members. So we're just so pleased that we do have this document, and we're going to use this as a framework and as a guide to move us forward to tackle all of the recommendations that the task force has presented for our consideration. So thank you very much. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.